We don't know the infectious dose. We don't know if it's for sure the cause of disease or if it's just something that super infects. We don't know if the NOD2 mutation data that our lab has represent a generic deficiency that NOD2 recognizes everything, or if there's something selective about how it recognizes mycobacteria, and we don't know the right antibiotics to treat this organism. There are two unknown unknowns in my mind, and I expect that somebody in the room is going to ask me about it, so I've tried to anticipate your questions. If mycobacteria may be impaired tuberculosis in cows, do farmers get more Crohn's disease? <laughs> I don't know. Is there a higher rate of Crohn's disease in people in contact with sick cows? Crohn's, as I understand, is not a notifiable disease. You can't go to the provincial registrar and ask, what is the incidence of Crohn's in farmers? What is the incidence of Crohn's in veterinarians? So until somebody does that study and says, yes, they are, or no, they aren't, I don't know. My understanding is Crohn's has an incidence in Canada of, say, what is it, uh, 15 per 100,000? Is that the latest data? Are there 100,000 veterinarians in the country? Probably not. So if vets were at 15 per 100,000, they went up to 16 per 100,000 or 20 per 100,000, there's not 100,000 of them. So I don't know. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But even, oh, I'm going to come to that. The other question is anti-TNF agents. So I'm going to come back, back to that first unknown. OK. So if it not in cattle, shouldn't we absorb high, high, far, high rates in farmers and vets? As I said, I don't know their rates. But other things that are in cattle that make people sick don't necessarily make farmers sick. I am not aware that E. coli 157 is supposed to cause more hemorrhagic colitis or more hemolytic uremic syndrome in farmers. The CDC in Atlanta published a series of 8,958 cases of E. coli 0157, and exactly 11 had contact with an animal. We would not take that data and say, oh, E. coli 157 doesn't come from cows. I think we all know it comes from cows. It's in hamburger disease, it's in Walkerton. But bacteria that are in cows don't necessarily make farmers sick. I don't know why. We do know that some types of exposures are high risk, but foodborne pathogens do not necessarily present in farm communities. So I consider this an unknown unknown. I'm not saying I'm standing in favor or against, but um, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. So the other question people ask is, what about Remicade? How would I reconcile the use of infliximab if this thing is in people, shouldn't an anti-TNF drug make something worse? Well, first of all, I have found exactly zero published scientific papers on anti-TNF and mycobacterium avium perichoricosis. So I can't say if it's a good thing or a bad thing because there's nothing there instructing me. I can tell you that in the past two years, I've seen two case reports of people who had a complicated mycobacterial disease who were treated with anti-TNF agents. One person with leprosy that kept on coming back and finally they gave them infliximab and the lesions went away. And just this month, a case of somebody with tuberculosis meningitis that wouldn't get better until they gave infliximab and the person came out of a coma. So anti-TNF agents aren't necessarily bad for mycobacteria. They're not necessarily good for mycobacteria. It probably depends on whether you're trying to treat the infection or you're trying to treat the inflammation. Let us not forget that before anti-TNF drugs were brought on the market for rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease, they were originally developed to treat an infection. The first trials of these drugs were for something called septic shock. Septic shock is when you're in the intensive care unit, you've got a bacterial infection in the blood, and there was so much inflammation that they were using these drugs to reverse what I call pathogen-induced inflammation. So just because we use anti-TNF drugs does not mean it's an autoimmune response or an, uh, another response. These drugs could be working because they reverse pathogen-induced inflammation. Again, I don't know. All I'm saying is the utility of these drugs don't sway me one way or the other. I think, to me, that it's an unknown unknown. So finally, thank you, by the way, for staying this late to listen to me through this. <laughs> I think mycobacteria may have impaired tuberculosis associated with Crohn's, but the role in disease causation requires more investigation. 
I think that this organism lacks fundamental understanding and lacks applied understanding. We really just don't understand a lot about this organism. It's a bit of a mystery. And for everything we know about it, there's a new idea and a new hint and a nuance that somebody says it does this or it doesn't. And then we have to find out is it true or not. So until we know this organism better, I don't believe there's an immediate fix. Again, I believe that more investigation is needed. But not only do we have to think more about this organism, I think we have to take a step back. And most people study mycobacterium and avium paratuberculosis to a large extent study that organism as the sole thing that causes everything. And when you look around and look at the IBD research community and all the fantastic advances, I think you have to sort of say, well, how would this thing fit in the context of other things that are coming out? What about all that great genetic study? Does mycobacterium avian paratuberculosis fit with the NOD2 hypothesis, with the autophagy genes, or not? Is there any link or not? What about all that new stuff about E. coli strains that might be adhering on the gut flora? Well, are these uh, exclusive, or is it possible there's an interaction that this organism and this organism somehow might have some symbiosis together? What about mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis and anti-inflammatories? Would anti-inflammatories make it worse or better? So I think that one of the key challenges in this field of research is to put this research in the context of all the other things that are advancing in Crohn's research in 2008. So finally, I could have started with this because you probably want to know who's paying me or who's funding this and my conflict. I've been very fortunate that my funding has come from peer-reviewed funding agencies, including the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, who supported the Epi Research and the Broad Foundation in, the LA, in LA, the National Science and Engineering Research Council, who supported our work on the organism as a veterinary pathogen, and now the Canadian Institute of Health Research that's funding both our bacterial work and our understanding of the NOD2 protein. And I get my salary to do research from previously CIHR, now from what's called the Fonda de la Chance en du Québec, and from a scholarship fund at McGill University. Thanks for your attention. I hope you still have energy for some questions and comments. All right, the fastest hand over there, I think you're number two. Thinking back to the first map, it was the incidence of Crohn's in sort of northern Western hemispheres. And what you said, you, would you expect there to be sort of more cows, if this is a factor, or, or more of that bacteria in those areas to account for the incidence? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good question. Um, I don't know if it's about, does anybody know, how, how can I get to the my computer here? <laughs> oh. I published an analysis on the global incidence of Crohn's compared to global incidence tuberculosis earlier this year. And if I can find it, I didn't put it in this talk, and I should have, because obviously you asked about it. Um, it looks like mycobacterial diseases provide some cross immunity. Forgetting about paratuberculosis, the, the two classic mycobacterial infections of all mankind have been tuberculosis and leprosy. And if you look around the world, you will very rarely see them in the same place. Tuberculosis is urban, leprosy is rural, and it, it could have been that one vaccinates against the other. So when I saw that um, global atlas of Crohn's disease published um, in the journal Inflammatory Bowel Disease recently, uh, what did I do here? Where am I? Um, no. Hmm, I'm looking for Calgary. I don't see Calgary. Okay, sorry. I don't see it in there. What I did is I put the incidence of Crohn's disease for 26 countries into Excel, and I went to the World Health Organization and I put the incidence of tuberculosis. And I went to UN and looked at uh, cardiovascular death and um, per capita GDP for all 26 countries. And there's a trend that the richer countries have more Crohn's disease, but it's a very kind of loose trend. And there's this fantastic inverse association between tuberculosis and Crohn's disease where the countries like Canada and New Zealand that have the highest Crohn's rates have almost no tuberculosis, and other countries like Sudan and South Africa that have tremendously high TB rates have almost no Crohn's disease. Just an association, just an idea. Is it because of the amount of cows with it, or is it because of the human exposure? I actually can't say. 
if you're interested and you want to send me an email, I'd be glad to email you back the article. But it, it does sort of make you